Well, thank you everybody for showing up. I've been kind of running from one location to another, but this has been a, a good time. I'm gonna be talking about a series of cases that quite frankly, I had spent more time on than the Golden State Killer case back in the, the early 2000s up until about 2010. But first, I wanna talk about Lil Susie. And as I go through this, you'll understand why I'm bringing Susie up. Susie was over at her sister's house. She was babysitting. Sister went out and uh, her young child was inside the apartment. And when sister comes home later that night, Susie was gone. And she was missing for about six days. And then her nude body was found floating in the Sacramento River Delta. Single stab wound to the chest. I initially got involved in Susie's case around 1996. I was working as a serologist at the Contra Costa County Sheriff's Crime Lab as a serologist back during this era. I was doing screening for physiological fluids, identif identifying saliva, semen, blood, as well as doing the old conventional serology. That's how old I am. I was doing ABO testing and enzyme testing, something that many of you probably have never heard of. But we were right at the very beginning, the forefront of the new modern DNA era, this PCR-based testing. Though it wasn't, just to get a little bit technical, it wasn't the short tandem repeats that the current FBI's CODA system is built upon today. This was an old dot blot system something uh, called uh, DK-alpha polymarker. Not very discriminating, but it was better than ABO and the enzyme testing, the protein testing. So I am working in the lab. This is right around the time in my life when I was starting to get a little frustrated of being, I was doing crime scene investigation, doing the field work, but doing the lab work wasn't necessarily my cup of tea. You know, sucking fluid from one tube to another, gets me a little anxious. I wanted to be more involved in the case. But here with, with Susie's case, I'm handed her sexual assault kit. This is uh, evidence at the time that I'm looking at it that's 16 years old at this point, because she had been killed back in 1980. So as I screen her sexual assault kit, I'm looking for anything that we might be able to move forward to this fledgling DNA technology. Unfortunately, I didn't find anything. I didn't find anything to advance the case from that, from that evidence. Couple years go by. Now we have a series of women, four women killed over a six week period of time. I'm going out to these cases. The first one, 15 year old Lisa Norell, she went to a Quisinera rehearsal in Antioch, California, kind of the east part of my county. And for those of you that aren't familiar with Contra Costa County, if you think of the San Francisco Bay Area, you have San Francisco close to the ocean, then you have the Bay, and then right across from San, San Francisco is Contra Costa, the opposite coast of San Francisco. Antioch is the eastern part of our county. Lisa's at this Quisinera. She's wearing sweatpants, sweatshirt, and she had brought her rhinestone dress that she would be wearing at the actual event for this rehearsal. She also had high heel shoes that she had been carrying with her. She gets into, as you know, teenagers do, a little bit of a, uh, a fight with a boy at this uh, rehearsal, and she decides that she's going to walk home about 11 o'clock at night, walk from Antioch into the city of Pittsburgh across a stretch of a road that we know as the Pittsburgh-Antioch Highway. This is a very dangerous road. It's very isolated, and Lisa never made it home. A week later, after massive searching, Lisa's body is found tucked up against this nursery building right off of this highway. She had trash piled on top of her and then these two pallets to hide where her body was located at. She's fully clothed, 
Her cause of death is something that I cannot reveal. It's what we call a holdback because we want to ensure that if we interview the right guy, if he d divulges how Lisa died in detail, we know we have the right guy. I spent a lot of time with Lisa in the morgue, and it's something that is etched into my brain forever. No 15-year-old girl should ever be there. A couple weeks go by. Jessica ends up being killed. Jessica, at the last few years of her life, were hard. She got addicted to tar heroin. She ended up resorting to sex work on the streets in order to be able to support her habit. <clears throat> Jessica's body was found discarded in this industrial area between a commercial business and, in essence, a tow truck. The pathologist took a look at Jessica's body and thought she had been run over by a car. She is so badly mutilated and bludgeoned. Jessica died a horrific death, and I can't go into details about it. But when I say that these serial predators, particularly the ones that are sadistic, the sexual sadist, this is the worst type of offender because they get sexual gratification from inflicting pain while the victim is still alive. This is very, very different than what we often see with post-mortem mutilation. When I was in the process of writing my book, my collaborator on that, Robin, met with me and I took her course to Golden State Killer locations that were significant, including D'Angelo's house, but also to the locations that were significant to this Unsolved series. And when I went to where Jessica's body was found, there was this makeshift memorial that, had, that was weathered and had obviously been there for quite some time. One of the issues that I have with the true crime media is they will not do stories on sex workers. And I think that is a mistake. I come out of real crime, this is real crime, this is a real person that suffered, and there are real people that still care and they want an answer, and they want justice. After Jessica's case, another week, week and a half goes by, and then Rachel is found. Rachel is fully clothed like Lisa. Same type of mutilation had not occurred with Rachel. She in evaluating her clothing, her pants were on inside out. They were like, uh, sort of like sweatpants, inside out and backwards. She had been redressed by this offender. There was a dilute blood stain that was no, uh, lower down on her knee that did not match up with any of her injuries. So I was able to reconstruct that this, her pants had been off her body and had contacted probably her face with the dilute nature of this blood stain. Rachel, like Jessica, had had uh, a hard time in the last few years of her life and was out there working along this stretch of road and ran into the wrong guy. I wish I had a better photo of Rachel. This is obviously a mug shot. Um, she was dis distant from her family and was pretty much all alone. And the same day as Rachel's homicide, we had Tammy. And Tammy, also working the streets, was picked up. She's found inside this porta potty. She had been beaten so badly, had suffered so much brain damage, she couldn't remember what had happened to her.
And then finally, Valerie. Valerie had moved away. She had recently come back. She was living with her, with her boyfriend. And she went out onto the stroll area, stood on a street corner while her boyfriend hid in the bushes as her bodyguard. And he remembers seeing this boxy old import car with what he described as this large set looking man pick Valerie up. And the typical process is Valerie and the John would go to a location and then they would come back and then Valerie would look for more customers. Valerie never came back from the man that picked her up in this boxy brown import car. The next day, Valerie's body is found in a ditch. And like Jessica, Valerie had been extremely mutilated, sexual sadist. So now there's four women, Lisa and Rachel, who were left fully clothed, similar causes of death, similar things being done. And then you have Jessica and Valerie, who are found mutilated. Is this the same offender? On one hand, I know conclusively, without DNA, that Jessica and Valerie were killed by the same offender based on the patterns of mutilation that occurred to their body. It was that unique. Fairly confident that Lisa and Rachel were killed by the same offender based on the commonalities that that offender had done. But because of the disparate natures between these two sets of women, and absent the DNA that we need, because I will tell you right now, I don't have conclusive DNA that I have confidence that came from the offender. That's one of the reasons why the, these cases are still unsolved. So I'm wondering, do I have one offender? Do I two, have two offenders? But the fact that I have four women killed within six weeks period of time in the same area, this was a spike. This wasn't the general pattern. Pretty confident the same offender killed all four. This is what I refer to as my white whale case because this case haunts me to this day. It's a case I failed on. I spent so much time trying to figure out who this guy was. <clears throat> This guy is possibly still out there and possibly still hurting women somewhere, not necessarily in Contra Costa County. <clears throat>